This is True Crime Kent. Okay, y'all. Uh, when we left Carl Panzram in part three, kind of seemed like he was turning over a new leaf in life. Yeah, it seemed like the wizard warden somehow figured out how his heart worked. <laughs> it was like this, it yeah. was like a fourth character on the Wizard of Oz. It's like, I hope the wizard can give me anti-crazy medicine. And he figured it out. I don't really know. I mean, he had gone over seven months without raping another man. Yeah. Or burning down a major building. It's crazy. Yeah, Spud Murphy, old warden Spud Murphy, was like he had found the key to Carl's heart. It's true. And unlocked that little shriveled black thing in his chest, like the Grinch. It, it beaded for beat bet bedded beat it beat it beated. <laughs> What's the correct? It beat. It beat for the first time. Yes, that day. I wish it had been near Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, under Warden Spud Murphy, Panzram was doing well. He had a good job at the prison where he, for the first time, worked hard at his job. Because, you know, he never he had a history of not trying at his prison jobs. Yeah. He was in the band as the flag dude. That's that. He had a little uniform. Still, I can't. I, I just can't. <laughs> I can't believe that that's true. I mean, it's just so weird. Just Carl Panzram out front. <laughs> He's got the the he's got the the staff and he's just like huh, huh yeah huh, huh. I can't see it a man with like seventy eight confirmed rapes <laughs> just just six months earlier would have literally blown the world up if given the option and now he's got a little uniform and he's hauling a flag in front of a prison band and that's very cute yeah. Uh, he was staying out of trouble. He's getting evenings off to go and do as he pleased, which is, I think, the only time in the history of prison that anybody's ever gotten that. Yeah. But it's all about the change up. Oh, darn it. Now, in part three, we talked about the changes that Spud Murphy put into place there at the Oregon State Prison and all of the positives that it brought along with it. What we didn't really get into was the negatives. Hmm. And there was one blaring negative about things being this loose, I guess, and that was escapes. The new warden, Old Murphy, had an extremely positive impact on a large portion of the inmates, but it also made escaping very, very easy. Oof. And as time went on, that began happening frequently. In Murphy's defense, though, 85% of the escapees were either caught or or they returned on their own. Again, this the the age the, that they were doing these things under their own volition. Just I don't know. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it is. But I don't know how well that holds up in a conference call. <laughs> like, well, yeah, Governor, they're getting away. Yeah, they're running off, but they're coming back too. That's a good point. huh? Eighty-five percent of them come back. Only 15%, so if 100 inmates get away, 85 of that, that's only 15 murderers, rapists, and serial killers that are out in town nearby. And that's pretty good numbers, Governor. Yeah. September of 1917. Carl is released from the prison for the evening like he had many times before. At this point, they just kind of, Carl shows up to the gate at the evening and he's like, let me out. And he goes out into town and does what he wants, and he's back by supper. But one thing we didn't talk about in part three is that there was a large hospital near the Oregon State Prison. And because of the existence of that hospital, there were oftentimes many attractive young nurses out and about town enjoying themselves. Mm. And men can't, can't, they cannot ignore nurses. Something about scrubs. Yeah. I guess. I think the porn industry has done that. 
I blame the porn industry for sexualizing scrubs. Yeah. Because one out of three videos on any porn site is hospital and nurse related. What seems to be the problem, sir? Wow, 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 wow. What's that? You took an extra blue chew on accident and now you have an erection that's lasted four hours? <laughs> I studied in cockology in college, so I think I can help you with that. That's not even a fucking uh, something you can major in. <laughs> on one evening that September, Carl bumped into one of those nurses. That young nurse found Carl Panzram good looking and charming and even offered to let him help her finish a bottle of booze that she had with her and how could she not find Carl Panzram charming? He must have been cute, sitting there in his black and white stripes, face twisted into a permanent grimace of misery, hatred, and anger. This is a fixer-upper, as the girls call him. I can fix them. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's in prison. He's committed 87 sodomies and rapes on men, and he's probably killed a bunch of people, burglarized, caused hundreds of thousand dollars in damages, and pillaged across the nation. But I can fix him. <laughs> Anyways, Carl happily agreed to help her finish the bottle. And after he got real good and sloshed, he probably had sex with her too. Carl thought to himself, I could be doing this all the time. (laughs) Why the hell would I return to prison voluntarily? He kind of moment, he got good and drunk and then broke out of the spell that Murphy had placed on him for just a second. And in a moment of weakness and drunkenness, he broke out of that spell. He said that evening, it was just like a a perfect storm of good things hit Carl. He's drunk. He's with a pretty young nurse. He said the evening was clear and warm. The sun was almost set. The moon was out. And the time had come for him to return to prison. And would, would you have a hard time going back to prison after that? I know I would. Yeah, I think those are, I wonder, it'd be interesting if you had the, like all knowledge to to go in uh, to get the data on how many people are sitting in prison for a snap decision you know what i mean yes that'd be interesting i would say probably half of them yeah 50 percent of them they just made a bad decision one time right and i think we can all agree this isn't carl's first bad decision no but i get it kind of you know you're he's probably laying in bed with this nurse they're giggling together and drinking a bottle of booze, and the it's a clear, beautiful summer evening. The sun is almost set, and then you have to go back to prison. I, you know what? I it, this makes me wonder how many people out there are in marriages where some snap decision happened. It didn't end up as a crime, but imagine this: like some guy, innocent maybe enough, has is having having relations with their wife. Decides to get a little creative and tries choking her, you know, and she's like, oh, no, what? No. You know, and he's like, oh, yeah. Or she doesn't at all. And then you're burying her. (laughs) (laughs) She doesn't say anything. (laughs) No, it makes me wonder, though, like how many snap decisions have happened where life just went on after that? Because, you know. They didn't talk about it. There's that scene where they're sitting at the table. He's stirring a cup of tea. You can hear the house cr- like creaking because of how quiet it is. Yeah, she's got bruises around her neck. He's uh, he just quietly says, "How, how are the stitches?" And she's like, "They're fine." Okay. Well, I'm gonna go into the garage. <laughs> That's mean. That's I was walking, terrible. But. I, was getting the, I was getting the paper. The petunias are blossoming. <laughs> Anyways, I got to go change the alternator. <laughs> um, look, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't know. thought maybe you'd be into it. Now I know. Now we know. I won't do that again. Uh, we shouldn't laugh about that, but I'm sure prison isn't the only place where snap decisions have been made and... You know, she's like, Lenny, it wasn't the choking. It was the rusty hook. Like, <laughs> that was. And you know what a rusty hook is, don't you? No. Do I want to know? It's where you it's doggy style. You put a, a your pointy finger in their bum hole and then you pull it out, hook it and then reach around and grab them in the mouth 
and pull their head around sideways. With the same finger? Yes. Oh! Hook. <laughs> oh! Oh, I can't. Okay. See? Ugh. Anyways, yeah. Carl's laying here with this beautiful nurse. They're enjoying booze. <clears throat> and he's thinking, why the fuck would I voluntarily go to go back to a prison? Well, I mean, and this is Spud Murphy's prison, but it's still a prison. And while he's thinking this, over the hill, Carl hears the whistle of a freight train. And on this, Carl said, quote, I stayed too late and then being drunk, I thought I was a pretty dumb slob to stick around there when I could be having that kind of a good time all the time. The night was warm and the moon was shining bright. A freight train was whistling down in the yards, calling to me, I figured. Anyways, I answered. Unquote. Oof. That's right. The plane went toot toot, but Carl heard, Carl! <laughs> Carl! <laughs> Carl! Uh. He hopped on a train up and he spent the next week he, he wasn't on that train long. He hopped off probably like the next town down and spent the next week moving and hiding through the woods, in the woods. And on foot, he covered 36 miles in six days through the woods. Wow. That's. Yes. That's. That is moving. That is moving. You got to keep in mind, though, this is the 1920s. Men were way different then. It's not like now where it's like, I cannot get my day started without a latte. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing that I, I like to think about a lot is if you got up right now and you walked, you get up, you walk. Yeah, exactly. Miles, exhausted. Ex you'd be exhausted, but <laughs> you have. No, the part where you said if you got up right now. <laughs> <laughs> you'd need a nap. Now, if if you made it 30 miles. Just just think of the footwear today that we have that makes that possible. Like the rest of your body would fall apart probably, but your feet would probably be okay. These guys had like leather bottom soles on their shoes. And, you know, it's like a, a whole different world as far as like the footwear they were wearing. These guys are. Yeah, their shoes are made out of like beaver teeth. Everybody wore dress shoes. Everything laced up. All the time. Yeah. Walk thirty miles. That's a that's a good point because any picture we have of Panzram, he's in a suit, uh, yeah, just like everybody else in this time. He's not, he's not surviving in the wilderness in a cutoff and some basketball shorts, right? I don't. He's know. in like a three piece suit. Do you have this problem? Are you like, man, this hat's starting to stink after you wear it for a year and a half? You know, like these everything that they would three piece suits in the summer. I don't. Yeah, I don't get it. Anyway, he eventually finds a bicycle near a town called Shed with two D's in Lynn County, Oregon. And then he rides that bicycle five miles south to the small town of Tangent in Oregon. And there in Tangent, Panzram breaks into a house and he steals some food, clothes, and a loaded pistol. Then he, with his loot, hops back on his bike and starts pedaling further south. Now, of all the escape vehicles that one of the most terrifying, notorious serial killers in the history of the United States could get away on, the bicycle is probably the most goofy and unintimidating. Yeah, right? Yeah. And this isn't even a bicycle that's like a, a cool-looking bike, like a Huffy with stunt pegs or some shit. <laughs> this is a silly-looking 1920s bicycle. We're talking the just bring, bring. Well, and I don't know why, but all those bicycles, they were geared so that your your legs did not move fast. It was always... Yeah, people were built different, man. <laughs> uh, and like I said, like we were talking about earlier, bicycling in beaver teeth shoes. <laughs> A few hours later, after stealing this bike, he's seven miles further south in Albany, Oregon, and while bicycling through Albany with the bag of goods on his back, Chief Deputy Sheriff Joseph Frum recognizes Panzram and tries to arrest him. 
Panzeram's escape was no secret. They kind of put the bulletin out to all neighboring. So he was being looked for. They were on his on his rear end. So this chief deputy sheriff from sees Panzeram says, Halt! And Panzeram just opens fire with the pistol that he stole from the house. Ugh. There was a full-blown gunfight in the middle of town in Albany, Oregon. And after that brief gunfight was over, Carl Panzeram found himself out of ammunition. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, and Carl was arrested. Oh, man. That they even arrested him rather than... Kill him? Just kill him. Yeah. Yeah, at what point do you... This is a good question. Because as we know, this story does not have a happy ending. At what point do you... As somebody who is even for prison reform... At what point, and I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me, but at what point do you go, this is a lost cause, let's just kill this guy? Yeah. Ugh. And they have, I'm asking you. Well, they had all the justification in the world right now because he's shooting at them. I mean, yeah. It, 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 you know, they're going to write history on this one, so if they shoot him, I hate to say it, but if they're so fed up with him, they could shoot him after the fact and be like, nope, he caught a bullet during the gunfire. Huh? Huh? What do you know? <laughs> Saved a bunch of people from getting raped and killed. I, I mean, that's exactly what they did with Otto Hooker from part three. If you remember, they just dragged him out from underneath the house and shot him on the spot. Yeah. <sighs> and it doesn't end there, Op. Because in the back of the sheriff's car, on the way back to the Oregon State Prison, Carl managed to slip his chains, get a hold of Sheriff Frum's pistol while he was driving, and then attempted to shoot him point blank in the car, but the gun misfired. Yeah. I think a misfire is just as justifiable to shoot somebody as if the gun went off, you know? Go for it. This is two times now in Carl Panzeram's life that he's tried to kill somebody and had the gun misfire. I don't know if you remember the preacher in part one. Yeah, yeah. Carl is knocked unconscious and returned to the prison in chains. And on returning to the prison, this is what Carl had to say. Quote, After I robbed that house, I felt that I would rather die than be brought back to prison to face Spud Murphy. I guess that's the reason I had the courage enough to put up a gun battle in the middle of town. Me alone against the sheriff and the rest of town. Unquote. That's right. He didn't want to go back to prison so we wouldn't have to look daddy in the eyes. Yeah. It's so weird. The dynamic's working. Like, look at him. He's like, I'm scared. Oof. It's working, but like, only in the way that it would work on Carl Panzram, where his, <laughs> the way he deals with it is tries to kill everybody in town because that's better than having to go and <laughs> look this man that he respects in the eyes. Yeah. It's not like you or I stealing his Snickers and then having to own up to it, you know. Yeah, it's it's okay. It's all relative. You're right. <laughs> like even Carl Panzram can 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 pervert this. Yeah. Innocent feeling that he has. <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather kill the whole goddamn police department than have to look that man in the eyes because I'm ashamed. <sighs> this was the beginning of the downfall of Spud Murphy, unfortunately. Spud was absolutely heartbroken by Carl's escape and gunfight. <laughs> and this is when Spud starts kind of second-guessing his beliefs. This is one of the saddest parts in the story, in my opinion, seeing this man's spirits break. He put a lot of faith in him. you know. He and did. Ugh. And this broke Spud's spirits. He, like, sadly reopened the bullpen. It broke his heart to reopen, but he's like, I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to do. So he reopened the bullpen and, and probably through teary eyes had Carl put back in there, Ugh. like putting down a dog you love. But yeah. And then, and then punishing all the other dogs because, because of that dog, you know? Like, yeah. Ugh. Put down a dog you love because it got out and shot up a police department. <laughs> <laughs> hate it when that happens <laughs> he also begrudgingly made an example of Panzram by cuffing him to the cell door of the bullpen for eight hours every day during the last three days of September 1917 so even if you look here 
even when Spud Murphy puts his foot down and is like, I've got to get back to punishment. It was only for three days and they weren't having to walk the bull ring even. It was just, you're in the bullpen and you're going to, and it was only for th- like, it's still in comparison to the punishments that Carl has received prior to this. This is a walk in the park. Oh, you're just going to cuff me to the cell door for three days. Yeah. But it is important to point out here up in that entire three days, you know, and all the other punishments Carl's ev- Carl's ever gotten. He's very non-compliant. He'll kick and fight and curse the whole time. Make as much noise. This three days. Nobody heard a peep out of Carl Panzram. I think one of the big differences is he, um, the, the warden is not an evil man, right? And so even if no. he's imposing punishment and everything, he's still reason uh, reasonable, I guess, you know, relatively speaking. Absolutely. And I think it's telling that this is the one punishment Carl received where he accepted it on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was ashamed of himself. Right. Meanwhile, uh, cracks are starting to form in the other changes Murphy had made. The classroom, for example. Remember, he converted one of those old rooms into a classroom. Inmates were just using that classroom as a reason to get out of their cell. They weren't taking their education seriously. Like I said, escapes were becoming more and more common because it was now easier. And furthermore... On the rare occasion when guards did get into scuffles with the inmates, the guards now felt that Murphy always took the side of the inmates, which was causing tensions to grow now between the guards and the warden instead of the guards and the inmates. Yeah. So once again, like it was before, we just have a pressure pot boiling here, but for completely different reasons. That's a tough position to be in because, you you know, if you've ever worked anywhere where the where you've got that uh, that debate between like the customer's always right or no we protect our employees it's a hard hard line to have to support both you know in, in yes in measured amounts i would argue an easier thing if the customer is inmates <laughs> yeah and the employees are prison guards right it would yeah you 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 should have an easier choice to make <laughs> that's a bummer he was making some great changes because everything's starting to kind of collapse, the governor began, requ- if you remember Withy Comb, yep. began requiring daily reports from the Oregon State Prison. This governor has to be sick, by the way, of Oregon State Prison. <laughs> I bet he felt like he couldn't get anything, like this fucking prison again. Yeah. The whole thing's starting to come down. It turns out that much like Icarus, uh, Spud Murphy had flew too close to the sun. Reminds me, the the Oregon, the Oregon governor today must be equally just as sick of Oregon. <laughs> you know, I, I I would agree with you because I don't know anything about Oregon, but except for Portland's there. <laughs> but then I remembered that I, for whatever reason, I knew that Stand by Me was filmed in Oregon. Oh, and. The aesthetics in that movie, the shots are beautiful. So I don't know how you could be bummed about Oregon. Because all the shots that you would go and recreate there today would be covered in tent encampments. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. And then that half shots. of your state wants to join Idaho. <laughs> so yeah. that governor's got problems. Anyway. IPA breweries. <laughs> <laughs> It's beautiful state. beard oil shops. <laughs> December 3rd, 1917. Carl Panzram goes on trial for the escape, burglary, and assault that he had just committed with intent to kill. Assault with intent to kill. Spud Murphy still butthurt over all this, like and, and rightfully so, demands that Carl be taken to the courtroom in chains and taken out of the courtroom in chains. And that was not customary in those times. So he's really done with Carl. Yeah. He's over it. The court proceedings were quick and brutal. Carl Panzram was not, they did not take it easy on him. He was slapped with an additional 10 years in prison for the escape and assault. And that was on top of the four remaining years he already had left to serve. 
What doesn't make sense right now is we're in part four of this and we're nowhere near the end. <laughs> so <laughs> this should be the end of any normal criminal's life right here. Like roll the credit. <laughs> yeah. We're just getting started. Oh my gosh. So he's got 14 years now. And after this trial, it is evident that Warden Murphy's spirits were completely destroyed. Nothing was left. Like I said, this is like rescuing a pit bull that everybody says should be put down. Yeah. And then watching it make progress. Like, look, he's not, he, he still growls a little bit, but he's not attacking the mailman anymore. And everybody's like, everybody's like, you need to just put that pit bull down. Pit bulls are dangerous. And that one is especially dangerous. And you fight for the pit bull and you see it make a little bit of progress. And then that pit bull in the middle of a festival, mauls a small child in town square. It it reminds me of like the safety sign that you see in like a, a workplace where it's like zero days since a rapes have taken yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. You got to put a number on the board. <laughs> zero days since non-consensual sex. <laughs> this, I can't get my head around the fact that this story continues. Yeah. To let you know where Warden Murphy's head was during this, we actually have a letter that Warden Murphy, Murphy wrote to a judge in the days following his trial. And keep in mind when he says Baldwin, because Murphy re refers to Panzram as Baldwin in this letter, Jeff Baldwin is the name that Carl Panzram was using at the time. They still don't know this is Carl Panzram. Oh, wait. Through all of this? Through all of this. He's Jeff Baldwin? He's Jeff Baldwin. <laughs> Jeez. It makes you wonder if they knew that this was Carl Panzram. No clue. Oh, my God. This is just fucking Jeff Baldwin. Uh, Quote, and this is from uh, Spud Murphy to, to the judge. Quote, Baldwin's fall has done more to hurt the cause of the honor system than any other one thing that I know of. If I had made good, it seems to me that the rest would have been easy because he was such a notorious criminal. I think that this reformation, after all he had gone through and all the grief he had caused other wardens, would have shown that there was some good in every man if you could find it. I hardly know what my future course will be regarding Baldwin. I know for certain I will never trust him again. But what steps to take towards reformation, I do not know. I am inclined to think that it is hopeless. Unquote. So after Carl's time in the bullpen was up, Murphy had Panzeram thrown back into a normal cell in Gin Pop. But I think, I, and I don't know if this was like one last swipe at seeing if there was goodness left in him or or just like an apology, but he did give Carl another job in the kitchen. Puts him back in gin pop, gets him a job in the kitchen. And if I think this is something I haven't clarified. Being able to work while in prison or even jail is a privilege. Yeah, yeah. It's not like I think <clears throat> there's a misconception that those guys are forced through that. No, they try to get on those jobs because it's it breaks the monotony up from being in prison or jail. Yep. So he gets him another job in the kitchen. However, um, this relationship is already broken. Carl broke it because in late April of 1918, just a few months later, a snitch passes word to Deputy Warden Burns that Carl Panzram and four other inmates are planning another escape. So they investigate. They don't tell the inmates that they're investigating. They investigate and find that there was a, a little window that got that like looked down into the basement from the kitchen that had bars on it. Found that they had been cutting the bars to the prison basement and they were just propped up there. So they had already cut their way into the basement. And across the basement at chin level was another barred window that led out onto the front lawn of the administration building. So if they could get through that, they only had one more window to get through, to be clear and free out onto the front lawn and into the woods. And what, was this happening while they were doing their jobs? Yes. Okay. They were working on it together. Ah. 
So they had already got through the window into the basement. All they had left to, to stop them from freedom was that one more window at the back wall of the basement at chin level. Oof. So instead of welding the bars back up and letting those inmates know, hey, we found out about your escape plan. You guys no longer work in the kitchen. Instead of doing all that, keep in mind, this is a new Murphy. This is a new sped, Spud Murphy. This is a Spud Murphy that's fed up. He, he's sick of all this shit. So instead of letting the inmates know that they've been caught, he says, no, let them keep doing what they're doing. And instead, Murphy places guards with rifles in the woods outside the prison and tells them to wait. And when they come running out, kill them on sight. And yeah, I think it's fucked up that prisons are allowed to do this, but I'm not allowed to put fake Amazon packages full of rigged Tannerite on my porch (laughs) for porch pirates. That's kind of fucked up. Just another example of the government saying, do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) Fuck porch pirates, man. If we all worked together and just started putting Amazon packages on our front porches filled with rigged Tannerite, this this problem would fix itself. Because you can't steal things if you don't have fucking hands. <laughs> Along these lines, have you heard of this uh, shot detector that they have installed all around Chicago and other cities, too? I didn't. I thought this was a thing of my dreams, but it actually is a thing. They install this sensor system all around Chicago, and when a gunshot goes off... It can track where geolocate where the gunshot came from. It can pinpoint. Police. Yeah, genius, right? Well, the, the the mayor tried to get the whole thing removed. Why? Good question. Because <laughs> he thought it was racist. <laughs> yeah. I guess. I guess if you only have it installed in certain locations, it's racist. Maybe. But not if the results are coming back specific <laughs> locations. I don't know why that's. We really just expect our police forces to um, enforce the laws with their hands tied behind their back. It, yeah, it's weird. Speaking of hands, we should all join together and start putting Tannerite in Amazon <laughs> packages <laughs> on our front porches. I'll start. You start. We'll start a trend. And then we'll communicate about how well it's going from jail. Anyhow, Carl somehow gets word of this plan to have all of them executed when they're trying to escape and calls the escape off. So Murphy removes the guards from the woods. And somehow Murphy removing the guards from the woods makes it back to Panzram. So Carl calls the escape plan back on. This time, however, completely by himself. He leaves the other guys out of it. And in May of 1918, Carl Panzram gets into the basement of the prison. Once down in the basement, he takes off his prison jumpsuit and puts on a white uniform. It was a uniform for a cook. Somehow he had got a a cook uniform. Okay. Gets out of his prison jumpsuit, puts on a cook uniform. Honestly... If you think about this, he's like, this is less conspicuous, but still stands out a little bit. It's like, we're looking for a guy with a two foot tall mushroom hat, (laughs) probably going to be on a bicycle. (laughs) I am blending in with everybody else is wearing three piece suits. He's in a cook costume. So he's down in the basement. He's now in a cook uniform. He uses a bar spreader made from a screw jack, which is like a, uh, what you would use to, to jack up a car. Yeah. The cheap jack that comes with a lot of cars these days, right? Yes. Well, with the- and I don't know if he found that screw jack in the basement or if he somehow snuck, snuck it with him. But he gets that screw jack and uses it to spread the bars on the basement window. And after that, he was home free. Carl Panzram crawled out from the basement window onto the front lawn of the administration building at nighttime under the under the blanket of night and vanished into the woods went and made yet another successful escape from prison. This time, however, up, he was gone for good. This is his remark on that. 
Quote, I made a clean break. I have never been back since. I still owe 14 years there. That happened in May of 1918. Unquote. After Carl's successful escape, unfortunately, Warden Spud Murphy was considered an absolute failure and very quickly fired by Governor Withercombe. Dang it. Which makes it even sadder because this one man that he put all his hope and faith and his beliefs into ended up being the reason he was fired. And if you're keeping track now, that is now two wardens at the Oregon State Prison that were fired because of Carl Panzram. Man. Now, what did we learn from Spud Murphy? I think there's a sweet spot. I think that's what we learned. I don't think we should let inmates serve out their prison sentences at home, but I don't think it's a bad idea to maybe treat them with respect and like human beings. Yeah, I'd agree. I think Murphy went too far, but I think he was on the right track. I think he had the right idea. Yeah. Now, a $50 reward was offered for Carl's capture. That's $850 today, but nobody would ever cash in on that. And from here, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. First time we've done that in this series. For both you and Jess's sanity. (laughs) The rest of 1918 and 1919 are, well, to be honest, in the grand scheme of things, for Carl Panzram's story anyway, boring, to be honest. Maybe with anybody else's story, 1918 and 1919 would be worth doing a podcast on. But this is Panzram. Yeah, so at least in comparison to what we've covered prior to this and what we'll cover afterwards, 1918 and 1919 are more of the same, burglaries and stealing. Um, He burglarized through Pennsylvania and Maryland and then into New York. And from New York, he gets a seaman's ID and joins a ship called the James S. Whitney. And in the James S. Whitney, he goes to Panama and Peru. And in Panama and Peru, he worked in the copper mines at Cerro de Pasco, until there was a strike there, and when the strike hit, he went to Chuca Camati, Chile, where he worked for the Braden Copper Corporation, and then he went back to Panama for a short time as a laborer, and from there he made his way to Bocos del Toros, and then to Costa, Costa Rica, and then he went to Scotland and France and Germany, and there isn't anything. And all of these travels between the remainder of 1918 and all of 1919 that I want to get too deep into. Jess, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but when another podcaster says, now we're going to fast forward two years, they just leave it at that and move on. Not can't. No. He says, I'm going to fast forward, but then I'm going to give you a detailed outline on what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Kent, you're you're one of a kind. Look. The reason I'm doing it like this is, first of all, it's from all over the world. He is literally all over the fucking world, and it is hard to verify by old newspapers how much of this is true because he's everywhere. Secondly, it's honestly not all that interesting. There weren't even any rapes. Darn it. He wasn't even raping men that we're aware of. He doesn't talk about it, at least. As far as we're aware, in all these other countries all across the world, he's just working on ships burglarizing and stealing when he gets a chance and kind of seeing the world. So to cover this period of his life, because there's so much traveling and from here to there and from there to here and then here, and then I worked in this gold mine and this copper mine, and then I like robbed of this. It would take four more parts of TCK to cover this part of his life. I'm going to just stay quiet because I feel like any in, in, in any curiosity about that time you'll take as a challenge. <laughs> So. I'll tell you what, this is what we can do up. Oh, gosh. We'll stop this episode here. I'll get back to the drawing board. No, 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 we're good. We're good. And we'll make this a 10 parter. <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> please, no. I mean, I, it's weird because I say, please, no. I'd love to know what you come up with during those, but. But but also, please, no, uh, just for the sake of us being able to get this whole series out. <laughs> In August of 1920, 29-year-old, oh, geez. he's 29. He's not even 30 yet. We're at part four 
<sighs> he is not 30 years old. <laughs> 29, August of 1920, 29-year-old Carl Panzeram shows up in New Haven, Connecticut. Why do you think he's here, Op? To rape a guy, probably. No, even funnier. To get even with President William Howard Taft. <laughs> what? He wasn't even president then, was he? He was out of office by seven years at this point. <laughs> I got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you remember, William H. Taft is the one, the man that gave Panzram his three-year sentence in 1906 while Taft was Secretary of War and had Carl Panzram sent to Fort Leavenworth, where he got arguably his worst punishments he's ever gotten. And Carl Panzram holds a fucking grudge. Yeah, he does. Wow. And P- Carl Panzram, probably the only serial killer in history to have a personal beef with a former president outside of maybe Hillary Clinton. <laughs> At this point, Hillary Clinton has more kills than Carl Panzer. <laughs> than most serial killers. <laughs> Carl breaks into President William How ex President William Howard Taft's house. He makes it to his house. <laughs> gets in his house. <laughs> okay. And steals forty thousand dollars in jewelry and Liberty oh, Bonds. Jeez. He also sp- <laughs> He also steals President Howard Taft's specially gifted Colt 45 that had engraving on it. It had been a gift from another politician that had his name and everything in it. It was in like a display case. This Colt 45, by the way, spoiler alert, is going to kill a lot of people. Dang. He also takes $3,000 in cash. Which equi- which is equivalent today to forty seven thousand dollars. Now, why Taft had that much cash in his house? Like maybe he didn't trust banks. I don't really know about Taft's politics. If I'm being honest with you, well, he was a politician. Period. So they're making money. That's on the it. Side. Yeah, that to guarantee you that money went untaxed. <laughs> yeah. So he had three thousand dollars in cash in his house, equivalent to forty seven thousand dollars today. So Carl gets away with all that jewelry and Liberty Bonds and that special pistol and that cash, and he uses that money to buy a yacht, a yacht that was named the Akista, A-K-I-S-T-A. And this yacht, not shabby. not This is a nice yacht. Yeah, that would buy you a pretty nice yacht back then. Yeah. It had a living quarters for five people. Carl spends the first few months alone on this yacht. He's really getting into the whole sailor thing. This is his sailor. Cause he's just went all over the country, like on boats and he's gotten into sea navigation and being a sailor and boats and yachts. And after a few months alone on this yacht, he gets bored and hatches a plan. Carl Panzram starts going to New York and hanging around the 25 South street to look for sailors that were in need of work. And once he would find one or two sailors that were about his size, he would hire them right there on the spot and then say, yeah, you're hired. All that you need to do now, my my yacht has living quarters for five people. All you have to do right now is go get all your possessions, pick a room on the yacht, and put them in there. Put all your worldly possessions, all your money, everything, go put them on the yacht. And then we'll celebrate on the Akista. And he always parked his Akista or stationed it. What do you call it when you park a boat? Dock. He docked his Akista. Or moored it. He moored it at City Island. Mm. So he'd say, head to City Island. That's where the Akista is docked. Put all your possessions, everything on there and wait for me. So they would. They'd go get all their stuff, everything they owned, put it on the yacht. Carl would show up and then they'd start to celebrate. He'd start hitting them with booze. They'd eat dinner, they'd, ha- they'd chat, they'd have fun. Carl would get them real good and sloshed until they blacked out and then passed out drunk. What do you think happens next? And then they'd just have a good sleepover? Maybe. They would have a solid 10 hours of sleep, and then Carl Panzeram <laughs> would take them around the world and show them the world, and they got, they got paid well. It was like Aladdin. <laughs> it was like Aladdin. 
And it turns out Spud Murphy had had an effect on Carl. He decided to change his ways after thinking back on all his wrongs. And he retired in 1961 <laughs> as a as a aged seller with grandchildren and a wife. And that is where we will leave Carl Panzram. If you like TCK, <laughs> you can follow us at 1159 Media. 1159plus.com. <laughs> and you, now you say, I'm going to call you. <clears throat> I'm going to call you. <laughs> Don't. Bah! <laughs> Obviously, that's not what happened. Op, he would get them real good and shit-faced. And when they passed out, he would rape their assholes. <laughs> he would forcibly insert his penis into their buttholes. Oh, uh, baby reindeer. And then, after raping their assholes, he would retrieve the William Howard Taft Colt forty five pistol and put one well-placed round in their face. If you got really super drunk and passed out and then somebody started doing that to your rear, would you wake up? They wouldn't know that I woke up. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'd be so quiet. <laughs> oh, I regret asking. He killed 10 men this way with a president's gun. Oh, jeez. After he put a bullet in their head, he checked their clothes and everything they were wearing for anything of value, jewelry, whatever, whatever else they had left to offer him. And then he would throw their body into a rowboat that was on the yacht row out about a mile into the bay, attach a rock to the body, and toss it into the ocean. Ugh. Ten men met their end this way. And on this, Carl said, quote, They are still out there yet. Ten of them. I worked that racket for about three weeks. My boat was full of stolen stuff, and the people at City Island were beginning to look queer at me. So the next two sailors I hired... I kept alive and at work. One was named Delaney, and the other one was Goodman or Goodwin. I don't know. Unquote. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know how lucky they were. Very lucky. Jeez. Yeah, so he starts getting the heat. I wouldn't say heat, but he's looking. They're, they're noticing a lot of sailors going onto this boat, but never coming off. And a lot of people are going missing. So he's like, I better hire two and hang on to them for a little bit. Yeah. So he has Delaney here and Goodman or Goodwin. Not important enough for Panzram to remember, even though he spent quite a bit of time with these men. And one day, the three of, the three of them, Panzram, Delaney, and Goodwin, ended up going to Gravesend Bay in New York on the yacht. And once there, Carl sees an opportunity. There's another yacht there that looks like it has a lot of shit that he could take. And that was another thing he did a lot, was he was a pirate in the oceans outside of New York. He was notorious for also robbing other yachts. And this one he can't just pass up. So while the other two men watched his two hired hands, Carl robbed a yacht. And Carl figured, ah, what, so what if they see this? I'm going to kill them tomorrow anyway. So he had been planning on killing them too. So he didn't much care if they saw him. Yeah. So he robs this yacht. And however, they start heading down the coast, continuing down the coast. And on the coast outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey, a little while later, they're caught in a massive storm. And the boat capsizes and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Uh-oh. Carl loses his yacht. The three men swim to shore. And they're just kind of sitting there looking at each other on the shore for a minute. Carl pays the two of them off to not say anything. Those two men disappear into the city and leave Carl Panzram sitting there on the shore now with nothing left because all the stuff that he had stolen and everything on the yacht, he is now has nothing once again. If we ever get rich, we should go do a diving mission to find that yacht. I, I thought about that. That'd be great. Because we have a general idea, we know that it was off the, it was outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. 
I wonder if anybody has ever tried to find this, because apparently he had a shitload of, not to mention the fact that William Howard Taft's presidential None. pistol is in that wreckage. Yeah. Yeah. And it probably isn't scattered all over the ocean bottom because he would have he would have secreted it away inside of his yacht, you know, so it's probably all pretty secure in there. Yeah, and it's also it was a squall that capsized the boat. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it broke into pieces. Right. It just and drowned it, it. it just sank to the bottom. Yeah. All right. When we get rich. God, I wish I was a trip. diver. Me too. We'll become one. We'll become one diver, you and me. When we as get... far as I'm aware, nobody's even tried to find this. Uh, it really helped the podcast numbers if we dove to If we found Pan's Rams. I mean, we know what it's called and everything. And the podcast would blow up because we found a, a piece of Americana in, in William Howard Taft's gun. America would know who we are. You are. Exactly. And also it had a Kista painted on the ass of it. Yeah. That was its name. It would be so easy to identify. Like, without a doubt, this is Carl Panzram's yacht. It says a Kista on the ass of it. I, I think we should. I will say the Atlantic Ocean gets pretty deep pretty quick. So we'd have to look into that. But I'm up for it, so just let me know when you're available. That is something that I would be generally, genuinely interested in doing if I knew the right people yeah. and knew how to go about doing it. That would be so much fun. If only we knew a millionaire. Anyways, Carl Panzram made his way to Norfolk, Virginia. And this is when we get some more uh, world hopping, some more country hopping all around the world. From Norfolk, Virginia, he hops on a ship and heads to Europe. From Europe, he heads down to Angola in West Africa and begins working for the Sinclair Oil Company on a boat doing what he called, quote, driving inwards. Hmm. <clears throat> oh, I thought you said in words. You're saying the in N words. word. Now, in his writings, this next portion of Panzeram's story has a lot of the N word in it. Like, a lot. Keep in mind, he's in Angola, West Africa. I did top it out, so I don't know if that's racist. Is it racist if you top it out? Uh, this, this, might, this is just a minor suggestion. But what if we shifted this part right here and had Luther read the quote? <laughs> he's, he's up for it. I know he's up for it. But anyway. I wish I had thought of that. We totally can. We can still have him do it. You know what my favorite part of all this is? What? Obviously, aside from the N-word, is that I just said Carl Panzram used the N-word, and I know that some of the listeners, listeners just gasped. <laughs> and... We're talking about a man that has butt raped a hundred men, murdered ten men, burglarized and sodomized all over the world, and they were just shocked to find out he's racist. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Carl, no, no, Carl, please, not the N word. <laughs> I, however. I do have a line. I know people think that, that Kit Chungus, he'll say anything. I'm not going to say the N-word. Okay. I do have just a little bit of tact. Very little. But I've got a little. So what I'm going to do in this next quote is instead of saying the N-word, dropping the N-bomb, I'm just going to say grr. Okay. Okay. So this is a quote from Carl Panzeram, and I've replaced all the N-words with just grrs. Quote, there I went to work for the Sinclair Oil Company, driving gurs, and I sure drove the hell out of them, too. Can we keep it together, please? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Quote, there I went to work for the Sinclair Oil Company, driving gurs, and I sure drove the hell out of them, too. I wasn't there long before I decided to get me a girl girl. Girl. I got one. I paid a big price for her. I bought her from her mother and father for 80 escudos, which is about $8 in American money. 
The reason I paid such a big price for her was because she was a virgin. So she said. She was about 11 or 12 years old. I took her to my shack the first night and then took her back to her father's shack the next. I demanded my money back because they had deceived me by saying the girl was a virgin. I didn't get my money back, but they gave me another younger girl. This girl was about eight years old. Uh. I took her to my shack, and maybe she was a virgin, but it didn't look like it to me. I took her back and quit looking for any more virgins. I looked for a boy. Unquote. How? Okay. Crazy Carl Panzram aside, how do you... How do you have a family that has possible eight-year-olds that aren't virgins? That like, there there should be a podcast written about that horrible family. Yeah, this wouldn't be shocking in like <clears throat> Alabama or the fourteen hundreds. Yeah, but to have multiple children, you're willing to sell. All, yeah, also for for just eight bucks, eight dollars. Jeez. To be fair, in America, in, if you convert the currency, that's $150 today. So that can get you out of a pretty hefty water bill. <laughs> and you can now add pedophilia to the list of abominations that Carl Panzram has committed. I mean, he dabbled in pedophilia before this, but now he's just full-blown, also a pedophile. Like he said, uh, he was going to go look for a young boy now. He's done with girls. And he eventually found a young boy, too. And that young boy he discovered back at the Sinclair Oil Camp where he was staying, that young boy was a table waiter. And on this, Carl said, quote, I educated him into the art of sodomy as practiced by civilized people. But he was only a savage and didn't appreciate the benefits of civilization. He told my boss, and the boss man fired me quick. Unquote. These fucking savages try to bring the Western world to them, and they shoot it down. And fuck you up. (laughs) I didn't even say anything. So this young boy, Carl rapes this young boy and he quickly goes to the boss man of Sinclair Oil Company there at that camp and he's like, hey, that grouchy man, he raped me and I don't think that's fair. And the boss fired Carl. And Carl, after being fired, took a walk to clear his head and he eventually found himself sitting in a park. And this is what happened at the park up. Quote, While I was sitting there, a little gur boy about 11 or 12 years old came bumming around. He was looking for something, and he found it too. I took him out to a gravel pit about a quarter mile from the main camp of the Sinclair Oil Company at Luanda. I left him there. But first, I committed sodomy on him and killed him. His brains were coming out of his ears when I left him, and he will never be any deader. Unquote. I I, I need to, uh, at this point, I want to just say uh, that, did you know that at one point there was a test that they would do on pedophiles, and this was a test that they would do, and it was pretty modern times. I want to say it was the 70s or 80s, to see if they had been fixed of their of their pedophilia they would they would um they put this little rubber band it was a sensor and they'd put it around the man's unit right and then they would show them pictures of young people in provocative situations to see Mm, if seems problematic to see if the sensor sensed any increased blood flow in the member yeah make them watch like honey boo boo yeah. And I think about that sometimes when I hear a quote like this or when you get really graphic about something having to do with pedophilia. And I'm proud to say you aren't hard right now. I think I would pass. I would pass that test every single time. 
Just I I'm think just that saying. all the judges for little girls beauty pageants should be forced to wear one of those. I'd agree. Also, I'd hate to clean the underside of the table after a pageant. I strongly believe that any men that that have anything to do with those things are pedophiles. Yeah, you'd have a hard time explaining to justifying your quote unquote passion for pageants to me. Because you can do pageants and not be perv. You could just do adult pageants, right? But they choose to do child pageants. It's really weird. Yeah. They should have to wear that cock monitor. It'd be weird. Like, during the pageant, police just quietly show up and there's less judges. (laughs) So Carl, you know, he's sad. He's sitting at the park. And in a way to get over his sadness from being fired from the Sinclair Oil Company, he rapes and murders an 11-year-old boy. And everybody has their way of coping with the loss of a job. I myself would probably have a beer. Maybe (laughs) smoke a joint. Yeah. Everybody copes differently. I would like to say the Sinclair, I don't know if I've talked about this before, Sinclair Oil Company, their uh, mascot, a dinosaur, right? Yes. Earl Sinclair from Dinosaurs. Oh my gosh. What the heck? The Sinclair family... In the classic show, Dinosaurs, yes, that is a tongue-in-cheek reference because oil, uh, some of it is from, you know, broken down bodies, dinosaur bodies. Oh, my gosh. Ah, that's that's my next fun fact to know and share at the... You know what? Bean Bean's got a birthday party tonight. Everybody's going to hear that fun fact to know and share at her birthday party. (laughs) Everyone. (laughs) That is wild. After murdering that young boy... Carl went into town and bought a ticket on a Belgian steamer to head down to the coast of Libido Bay. And the last thing Carl Panzram needs is anything to do with libido, am I right? Also, it's called a Belgian steamer, which sounds like an innuendo. Yeah, it sounds like farting under the covers after eating waffles. (laughs) Chicken and waffles. Chicken and waffles, yeah. (laughs) Hit her with that old Belgian steamer. (laughs) When he got to Libido Bay, he rented a 22-foot canoe and hired six locals to go out with him hunting in the backwaters. This next bit is a little confusing. I don't know why he does this. I don't know if he was just on a murder spree now. He's just looking to kill people. So he rents this 22-foot canoe and gets six locals to go out with him to show him around. You know, we're going to go hunting. And once they're back in the backwaters, they find a ton of crocodiles, hungry crocodiles. So they're in this canoe. Keep in mind, Carl's sitting in the back of the canoe. This is a 22-foot canoe. This is a big, this is almost just a boat. The six locals that he hired are sitting in the front, kind of guiding with their backs to him. Yeah. When they find the hungry hungry crocodiles, he pulls out a German 9-millimeter Luger. And start shooting them one by one in the back. They can't do anything, obviously. They're out in the water. There's nowhere to go. He shoots them in the back, and as they drop in the floor of the canoe, he starts putting rounds in their heads. Wow. After he kills all of them, he dumps their bodies over the edge of the boat and watches as the crocodiles eat their corpses. This is just a random act of of murder. Wow. He, he, he didn't gain anything from it outside of maybe the canoe. Yeah, just just murder for murder's sake. And he sat there and watched the crocodiles eat them. Kind of fascinated by the whole thing. Yeah. Carl has himself a canoe now, and he goes back to town and ties it up at the dock. However, that night, while it was tied up at the dock, somebody stole his canoe. So this was all for nothing. Six men dead for nothing. He didn't even get the canoe out of the deal, which leaves him once again traveling on foot. Now we're going to fast forward again up. If you're wondering why, let me read this excerpt for you of Carl summarizing the next couple of months, the traveling, the jumping from here to here. And this is a quick summary. And if you wanted to hear about all this, let me know in the comments as the listener. This is the next couple months. This is why we're breezing through this. This is from Carl. Quote, Next, I bought a ticket on that same Belgium steamer, Belgian steamer. 
and went back to Luanda, where I went to Mr. Clark, the U.S. consul, and bummed him for a ticket to Europe, but he gave me the air and set the cops after me. That night I went to the house of a Spanish prostitute and robbed her of 10,000 escudos. She also set the cops after me, so I beat it. I couldn't get out of there by rail or by ship as the cops were looking for me, so I hiked out. I hiked north for the Belgian Congo, 300 miles away, through Ambrisette and Ambrise, and then up the mouth of the Congo River at San Antonio. There, I hired a canoe and paddlers who took me across to Point Banana. There, I bought a ticket on a French ship to Boma, and from Boma up to Matiti. Matiti. Matiti? <laughs> up to Matiti. <laughs> Matiti. I mean, his, his, his yacht was called a keister, a keista. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so there I stayed about a month, then broke. I couldn't get a ship. I stowed away on a U.S. ship called the West No-No. They carried me as far as Axim on the Gold Coast and then dumped me there. From there, I walked to Sekondi. And there I robbed some lime juicers and bought a ticket on the SS Patoni. On the Patoni, I got as far as Las Palmas, the Canary Islands. And there, the U.S. consul didn't know me, and I gave him a lot of bull, and he bought me a ticket on a Portuguese ship to Lisbon, Portugal. Unquote. So now you see how this gets, like, and then we went here, and then we went yeah. there, and then we went there, and then we went here. It's like... This is a fucked up version of that song, I've Been Everywhere, Man. <laughs> Reno, Chicago, Alabama, Oklahoma. This would just be the... Gers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. He's all over the goddamn place, man. He's everywhere. He's been everywhere. From here, from right now, he's in Portugal. And from Portugal, he makes his way to Avonmouth, England. And in the summer of 1922, from Avonmouth, England, he hops on a U.S. ship as a consul's passenger and begins to head back to New York in America. By July 18th of 1922, Carl Panzram was in Salem, Massachusetts. And on July 18th of 1922, from the woods... Carl Panzram sees a 12-year-old boy named George Henry McMahon carrying a small pail and skipping down the road. So this is kind of creepy. This is He's in the woods, he's watching, and he sees this little 12-year-old boy skipping down the road with a little pail. Little George, little 12-year-old George, was on his way to the store, the grocery store, with 15 cents because he wanted to buy some milk. When he saw George, he came out of the woods. Carl was wearing a blue suit and a green doughboy hat. And he approached little George and said, quote, Would you like to make 50 cents? Unquote. The kid's 12 years old, so he excitedly says yes. Carl took little George by the hand and led him into the woods. From a nearby house window, another little boy George's friend, a little boy by the name of Walter Crean, and Walter's mother, Margaret Crean, watched the entire thing happen. They saw a strange man come out of the woods, approach little jo- come out of the woods, approach little George, talk to him for a second, and then take him by the hand and guide him into the woods. This was the last time that anybody would ever see little 12-year-old George McMahon alive. Because once he got into the cover of the woods, Carl, to the surprise of nobody, attacks. He holds the 12-year-old down while he's kicking and screaming and rapes him multiple times. After he rapes him multiple times, he strangles him until he goes unconscious. And after the boy goes unconscious, Carl picks up a rock that was laying nearby and caves his head in. He beat his head so hard with the rock that the boy's brains came out of his ears. This is weird. This is odd to me because we're seeing kind of, I don't know if you'd call it devolving, where he yeah. goes from, I don't know. I mean, I guess 
Would it be considered pedophilia when he's a younger boy and he's doing everything that he did as a younger boy, you know, and now, but he seems to be returning to his old ways. But worse. But worse. Yeah. I mean, he's, he yeah. hasn't had a track record of kids to this point, really. We're in a, uh, we're working our way up to, I think, like frenzy stage. Yeah. Now, this next part is weird. I don't know why he did this. We still don't know why he did this. A lot of podcasts that cover Carl Panzram actually skip over this part, but it's so odd to me. After he's done killing the boy, he tears several pages from a Polish magazine that he had on him and shoves them down what was left of the boy's throat. Um, we still do not know why. Very odd. Hmm. You know, I've thought about this, and maybe he did this even before the boy was dead to stop him from being able to scream. Yeah. But they, when they did the autopsy, they found several wadded up pieces of Polish magazine paper shoved down his throat. Just three days later on Friday, July 21st, 1922, a mother and her 11 year old son, a little boy by the name of Michael Romano are in the woods there picking berries when little Michael Romano stumbles across the severely decomposing corpse of 12-year-old George McMahon. Now, obviously, the police go into full moat. Like, this this is a kind of a small, like, a lot of crime doesn't happen here. This is kind of your, like, Mayberry top town. Yeah. It's a 22. It's 1922. You know, this is fucking crazy. Yeah. The police start investigating, and that's when Walter Crean... And his mother, Margaret Crean, the two people that had watched the whole thing unfold through the window of their house. They tell the police what the man looked like. They say he looked Polish. He looked foreign, looked Polish. And they also tell him what he was wearing. That's how I knew he was wearing a blue suit and a green doughboy hat. But no leads are ever established. A short while after this murder, Carl Panzram finds himself in New Orleans. And in New Orleans... He, gets, he makes his way into a marine hospital there and gets into the drug room and steals two full suitcases of cocaine. Huh? Uh, Jazz? Yeah, huh? Oh, look at her drool. <laughs> two full suitcases. He steals two full suitcases of cocaine, morphine, and opium. With these two suitcases of drugs, he... Travels through New Orleans, St. Louis, and back to New York selling the drugs. So now you can add drug dealer. Successful drug list. dealer. <laughs> it's very successful. In February of 1923, after being out of drugs to sell, Carl gets a job as a watchman at 220 Yonkers Avenue for the Abico Mill Company. That location at 220 Yonkers Avenue is now an apartment complex, a big fancy apartment complex. Anyways, while working that job there at the Abico Mill Company as a uh, watchman, he meets a 14-year-old boy, also named George, and rapes him. But according to Carl Panzram, that little boy loved being raped. What? Because, according to Panzeram, he had been a sexually abused growing up and had developed uh, a bit of, uh, what's that called, uh, Stockholm Syndrome, I guess, where mm. in his little head, he related it with love. And so, according to Panzeram, the little boy loved being raped. I'm kind of uh, hesitant on agreeing with that, but the boy did voluntarily be around Panzram and Panzram continued raping that boy for the next two months. There's also some stuff that's going to happen here in a little bit to show you kind of where this boy's head was at. In April of 1923, after working as a watchman at the Abico Mill Company for two months, Carl quits. And in May of 1923, the next month, he steals a yacht in Providence, Rhode Island, sells it back to New York. And picks up that 14-year-old boy, George. Boy George. The little boy George. Voluntarily goes with him. See that, and this is where it's well, I guess if he went with him, I mean I was gonna say this is one of those this is one of those times where it'd be hard to know if you're reporting on truth or or 
Pans Rams. Exactly. Yeah. Myths. But it is, I mean, this boy went onto this yacht voluntarily with him, so they're... Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's, he's fucked in the head. He's right. He's not making good, he, he, he's been abused his whole life. This isn't somebody, that, this is somebody that probably needed a lot of psychiatry. Yeah. From there, Carl and little George sell to Kingston, New York, where they try to sell the yacht. They stop and try to get some money and sell the yacht. However, a man does show up wanting to buy the yacht. And Carl took the man out under the ocean to show him how it sailed. He even anchored it out in the ocean. And when they're discussing things, how much I want for this yacht, here's how things work, the man pulled a pistol and tried to rob Carl Panzeram. Oh, no. He doesn't know who he's pulling a no pistol. No clue. <laughs> uh. So this guy's out here. He's like, who the fuck is Jeff Baldwin? <laughs> fuck Jeff Baldwin. <laughs> I don't know who Jeff Baldwin is, but he's no goddamn Carl Panzeram. I can handle this guy. Carl, however, this guy just thinks this is just some schmuck with a with a with a yacht. Right? Yeah. He thinks this is gonna be easy. So he's like kinda half assing, waving the pistol he's got around. Like he also sees this little boy on the boat, probably thinks it's Carl's son. Carl catches him lacking for like a split second though, pulls a thirty eight, and shoots him twice, dead. Wouldn't it be weird if that's how the story ends, though? Carl Panzram, he he just gets shot during a boat sail. He then just ties... Carl said it was a large piece of lead. I don't know why he had a large piece of lead on the boat. He never described what the lead was. What? It, so I don't know if it was like... I don't know what it was. He says a large piece of lead. He said he tied a large piece of lead to the body and dumped it into the ocean. Hmm. And after this, here's Panzram. Quote, I then sailed down the river, stealing everything I could as I went. I got as far as Newburgh, New York. There, the kid, George, got scared, and I let him go home to Yonkers. When he got home, he told the police all he knew about me, which wasn't much, but it was, it was enough for the cops to come looking. They caught me and my yacht at Nyack, unquote. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it doesn't matter. (laughs) It doesn't. Carl is arrested for sodomy, burglary, and robbery, and thrown in the Yonkers jail. However, from the jail, he contacts a lawyer in New York named Mr. DJ Cashin. Cashin. That's such a... Fitting name for a lawyer, isn't it? Just sounds ching. like DJ Khaled or something. Like it should yeah. be a rapper. <laughs> Panzram contacts this lawyer, Cashin, and tells him, Hey, I've got a yacht. I've got the paperwork on it and everything. Mm-hmm. If you can get me out of the jail, if you can get me out of jail, you can have the yacht. Wow. He tells that to this lawyer. Now, this lawyer doesn't know it's a stolen yacht. And through some fancy lawyer footwork, Mr. Cashin holds up his end of the bargain and does get Carl out of jail. Wow. Well, that's... Carl that's, gives him the boat. Carl holds up his end of the bargain. He gives him the boat and the papers to it and then flees. However, Op, when that lawyer went and tried to register the yacht in his name, he found that the papers were forged, the boat was stolen, and he no longer had a yacht either. Also, what an am- like what an amazing lawyer. Think of the charges he was up against. Yeah. Wow. That's well, crazy. he had got him out on ba- on bond. Oh, so he still had is- to face the charges. But yeah. Carl doesn't give a fuck about showing up to a court date. Right. He just needed to be out long enough to run. Yeah. So this lawyer just got swindled. And he freed a murderer. And Carl is long gone. And by August 10th, 1923. Carl finds himself in New Haven, Connecticut, and there he kills another young boy. Um, Once again, he lures this boy into the woods where he raped him and then suffocated him with the boy's own belt. We don't know a lot about this murder. 
Panzram didn't talk a lot about it. Um, there's not any news. We just, they know, they suspect the boy's name, which I don't even remember. I didn't write it down because they just suspect it. They can't prove it was him. But after that boy was dead, Carl picked up his body and just threw it behind some bushes and went on about his life. From Connecticut, Carl went back to New York. In New York, he gets a job as a bathroom steward on the USS Grant, an Army transport ship. Fun fact about the USS Grant, it was originally a German ship. Really? But we captured it on April 6th, 1917, and then turned it into an American Army ship. Anyways, Carl had this job as a bathroom steward on the USS Grant for about 10 fucking seconds before he got fired for getting drunk and fighting people. Is it is that ship today, if you found it, is it a subway? <laughs> yeah, get it. It's a Dollar General. It's a Dollar General. <laughs> USS Dollar General. The next night, Carl Panzeram robbed the post office in Larchmont, New York. He was, however, caught in the act by police and captured. It all went down kind of without a hit. He was very quick. He was caught, like, red-handed and arrested on the spot. Carl was put in jail at White Plains, New York, and indicted for burglary. The trial went fast, and Carl Panzram was quickly sentenced to five years at the notorious Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York. And we've covered Sing Sing Prison before. I, I think a couple of the inmate of the criminals that we've covered on DCK have been to Sing Sing. Not a good place to be. And that is where we will pick back up in Carl Panzram Part Five. Jeez, do you want to give him any hope or light at the end of the tunnel? I don't Let's... know, man. I don't know. I, the crazy thing about this is we're intentionally trying not to banter much, right? Because of how much. much information is here. Yeah. I've been withhold. I withheld. A, I withheld coin facts this time. But you're going to say a fart? No, oh, coin facts. Do you, I, you know, actually, if, if it's making you withhold coin facts, I should just start doing like seven and eight parters regularly. Fun facts to know and share. Actually, um, now that we mentioned it, did you know that that in some prisons, the go- the the prisoners when they were when they were on the job making license plates. They would, some prisoners created their own die and cut their own coins and created currency for the prison. I did not know that. Yeah, it's true. They had their own currency inside the prison. Huh. Yeah, so I guess I didn't withhold my coin facts for today. I'm going to call you tomorrow, though, for more coin facts. That reminds me of, uh, what's the coal miner song? The gen- old my soul to the gen- sold my soul to the general store. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh,